I fear not the dark itself, but what may lurk within it. Welcome to Lurk, bringing you creepy, strange, and bone-chilling stories with your host, Jamie Jackson. Lurkers, welcome to this week's episode. Don't forget, for $5, you can become a Lurk patron and help support the show. Visit patreon.com backslash Lurk podcast to join. Listen. No squeaking or weird noises coming from my office chair. I received a new chair as a Mother's Day present. I got it early because it came in a box marked office chair, so I pretty much figured it out. So coming up next month, I may also be ready to gut the studio once we have the new windows installed. And once that's all done, sound should improve because outside noises won't be as easily picked up, and I plan on doing some soundproofing. Patreon will be helping to secure the soundproofing materials since the chair was already taken care of. Before we get started with this week's topic... Have any of you felt like something or someone was trying to direct you to do something? I don't mean voices in your head. I mean like you start thinking about something like a project and you can't get it out of your head and you just keep thinking about it. Curious because I've been in that situation the last few days where I keep thinking of this project and I keep working it in my head and no matter what I can't seem to let it go. And it just seems like there's something else behind it pushing me to do it. Kind of like otherworldly peer pressure. Or maybe I'm just completely nuts. I was just curious. It has absolutely nothing to do with the episode. But it just seems like no matter what, I can't stop thinking about it. It has to do with writing. Don't worry. I'm not like planning some huge jewelry heist or something. I'm talking about writing. No illegal activities involved. Let's get on to the topic, shall we? For this week's topic, we are going to be looking at some more stories about haunted islands and pirate ghosts and phantom ships. First up is a location called Jewel Island, which is one of many islands in the Casco Bay area of Maine. The area was once called the Calendar Islands because there were allegedly 365 land masses. There are actually 785 islands and exposed ledges in the Casco Bay. Jewel Island is one of them. Jewel Island is accessible only by boat and is about 221 acres. It is currently uninhabited and was once home to both World War I and World War II installments. Jewel Island sits about 8 miles from Portland, Maine, and is the furthest island from the mainland. It was settled by a man named George Jewel, who reportedly traded gunpowder, rum, and fishing equipment to the Native Americans for the island. He lived there as a recluse until he died from drowning in the Boston Harbor after a night of drinking. There were rumors that famous pirate Captain Kidd buried treasure on the island and still haunts the island to this day. I must say, in my never-ending research of various haunted locations, Captain Kidd is mentioned in more areas than any other person or ghost. He apparently haunts every single place he's ever rumored to be. While we may never know if Captain Kidd buried treasure there, it's not a stretch to think that privateers would choose this island to conceal some of their wealth. There was a man who acquired a map that was supposedly drawn by Captain Kidd. And it, of course, was a treasure map. The man was named George Vigny and came from St. John, Brunswick, Canada, in search of buried treasure around 1860. At the time, there was a man living on the island that was known to be pretty unscrupulous. And his name was Elijah Jones. Jones and Vigny hooked up. That is to say, they partnered up because hooked up has a totally different meaning. So Vigny and Jones partner up and become digging partners in an attempt to find the buried treasure 
on the alleged Captain Kidd map. Not long after this partnership, Jones seems to have quite a bit of extra money, and Vigny is never seen around again. When Jones was questioned, he said they never found the treasure and Vigny went home to Brunswick. Curious people went out to the island and found a large hole on the South Cove with a square imprint of what could be a large chest. Visitors to the cove began seeing a hideous-looking human form with glaring green eyes and blood dripping from his mouth whenever they came towards the area of the cove. Islanders poured lamb's blood around the spot where the hole was dug to exorcise the demon they thought was unearthed by Jones and Vigny during their dig. The lamb's blood uh, didn't work, by the way. I know, I'm just as shocked as you are. The thing did not confine itself to just the cove. Jones's home was prone to screams and moans. Windows and glassware smashed to pieces on their own in front of guests. Jones lived into his old age there and died in the late 1800s. Many thought he himself was a pirate and or a rum smuggler. Then sometime later, a farmer was plowing a field near Jones's old home and came upon a skeleton wedged into a crevice. The skeleton had a distinctive ring on its finger with the initials GV and locals recognized it as the ring worn by George Vigny. The hard looking ghost was never seen again after that, but the area is still haunted. There are peculiar lights and groans that come from the area of the cove. There's also the sound of shovels digging into the sand. There are allegedly seven other ghosts that roam the island. The female pirate, Anne Bonnie, allegedly buried some treasure on the island. After her men finished burying the loot, she killed them with her pistol and cutlass. This wasn't an unusual practice. Many pirates killed one or two members of their crew and left them with the treasure so their ghost would guard it. Seems like some twisted thinking to believe the ghost of the person you just killed is going to do you a favor in the afterlife. If I was one of those treasure ghosts, I'd lead people to the treasure out of spite. Just saying. Anyway, the ghosts of these seven men have been seen wandering the woods and shoreline. There were seven grave markers that were discovered in the 1960s that many believe mark the final resting place of those seven pirates. Pirates and unsavory treasure seekers aren't the only ghosts wandering around Jewel Island. In 1977, a young 15-year-old girl named Margaret Newland was visiting the island with her family. Margaret's father worked as a compass adjuster in the islets, so she was familiar with the small islands in the bay that her father visited. Jewel Island was one of the islands that was used as a garrison for the Navy in, the, in World War II. There are still gun batteries, tunnels, and remnants of the fort. Margaret often played around the ruins while her father worked. As she wandered the trail, she came into a tunnel that led to a gun platform. She heard voices coming from a small duct leading to the gunnery. She first assumed it was other explorers checking out the ruins. So she called out, but she got no reply. Margaret was standing several yards from the entrance when suddenly three figures in old uniforms and helmets came out of the ruins. One wore wire-rimmed glasses in the style of the 1930s or 40s. The men walked towards her, but it was as if they didn't even see her at all. She was standing there frozen in fear as they walked right by her and then disappeared. She rushed back to tell her family, but they didn't believe her. Years later, her family started to hear of other accounts of the ghost soldiers manning the batteries. That's when they started to think that perhaps Margaret had actually seen something. It isn't surprising with so much tension and stress happening during war that those who were in charge of keeping our shores safe would still be there manning their stations. And that's going to bring us to our next story about something that happened during World War II in Casco Bay. But first, we need a little background information. During the War of 1812, 
the United States needed fast ships that would be able to break and run trade that was being captured by the British fleet. In 1813, in Porter's Landing, Freeport, Maine, James Brewer built the Dash, a 103-foot topsail schooner that was fast. She was fitted for 16 guns. Ten of those were wooden models that were built to lighten the ship's load. In 1813 and 1814, the Dash made several runs to the West Indies trading cargo. The notoriety of the Dash made it all the way to the president at the time. That would be President Madison. President Madison had bigger plans for the schooner. On September 13, 1814, he granted a letter of mark and reprisal to the Dash's commander, George Bacon. This allowed the ship to seize cargo and other items deemed profitable for the war efforts from enemy ships. So the Dash was outfitted with two 18-pound guns and one pivot cannon. Her first voyage in her new role was very successful. The second voyage was even better. The crew took back a captured American sloop and also took a British ship with a cargo of rum. Even under a new commander, the Dash was successful. Then, in January 1815, the Dash sailed out with another privateer ship named the Champlain. The two raced, with the Dash pulling ahead. There was, of course, a storm brewing, and the Champlain's crew opted to return to port, to safety. But the Dash stayed its course, and she was never seen again. And that brings us to August of 1942, during World War II. A couple rode out to one of the islands in Casco Bay called Punkin Nub, having no idea what they were about to be a witness to. At the same time, there was a U.S. Navy ship patrolling the waters of Casco Bay from Portland to Harpswell, Maine. They were accompanied by an ally British ship called the HMS Moidor. Suddenly, there was the wailing of a siren. The siren alerted patrols that an intruder had entered U.S. waters. Guns were manned and batteries came alive with activity. A call went out for the enemy ship to identify itself but there was no reply. The Navy knew the unidentified ship was not authorized to be in the bay, as it was way too close to the mainland. At that point, the British ship fired upon the unknown vessel. The shell floundered, slightly striking Punkin Nub Island. The impact broke off a chunk of the bluff close to Homer Grimm and his companion. Can you imagine being there enjoying a picnic date and getting fired upon by the Navy? Fire in the hole! Gee, honey, was that a Navy missile or are you just happy to see me? Anyway, Homer Grimm and his unnamed companion were obviously shaken and on alert. They looked around the corner of the ledge where the shell had hit. And there they see a tall ship from the 1800s moving at a steady clip through the water. Mr. Grimm could also see the patrolling ships bearing down on the tall ship. They were close enough for him to see the men squinting trying to catch a glimpse of the mystery ship's name. The Coast Guard Navy and the British Navy converged upon the unknown ship. All came close enough to read the name of the three-masted schooner. Homer Grimm was able to see the name on the sideboard as well. Anybody want to guess what the name was? It was the Dash. Surprised, aren't you? The sirens and firing quieted as they realized it was not an intrusion, or at least not an intrusion by a ship within this realm. The ship silently went through the water without anyone on board. No shells or bullets pierced the ship. The ammunition had passed right through it. Then the dash dissipated into the fog and disappeared. Others have seen the ghostly vision of the dash in Casco Bay. It makes no wake and creates no sound. There's a story that the ship appears when one of the descendants of the original crew dies. As the ship nears land, the spirit of the deceased family member climbs on board and joins the crew for a journey into the afterlife. 
the dash then sails away and disappears. I did mention briefly, very briefly, Harpswell in the last story that I just told. It was part of the area that was patrolled by the U.S. Navy during World War II. Harpswell is actually the site of our next and last story for this episode. The Harpswell community includes three large islands in Casco Bay, Oars Island, Bailey Island, and I'm going to murder this name just so you know, Sabacodegan, Sabacodegan are connected by a succession of bridges. Harpswell itself is a narrow peninsula. The Neck and Sabacodegan Island were purchased by Colonel Shapley in 1659. The Native Americans called the peninsula Maraconiag, meaning quick carrying place because they could carry their canoes over it to get from one bay to another. Harpswell was incorporated in 1758, though it was settled before that. And it was also a haven for pirates. There was a small island in the area called Pond Island. The pond has now since dried up, and the area has been renamed Peaks Island. But back in the day, it was Pond Island, and there was a pond. Captain Ned Lowe brought a large treasure to the island and placed it in a secret place with the help of his crew. His men thought a better hiding place was in the pond, or maybe they just wanted it for themselves. This group, who thought the pond was the better hiding place, took the treasure and re-hid it in the pond. When Lowe found out, he became angry and wanted them dead. The group of men tried to get the cash out of the pond and escape, but Lowe and his crew, that was still faithful to him, cut them off at the pass. There was a bloody struggle, and it resulted in the death of several crew members. The treasure was somehow kept safe. Since then, residents of Harpswell have heard screams and shouts of bandits engaging in their battle. Phantom shots ring out in the dead of night, and ghostly voices fill the air. Incidents like books flying off shelves, heavy footsteps, items flying around, pictures lifting off walls, are all common occurrences in the homes of Harpswell. There is even a ghost horse that is said to run through town. There's also a story of a witch who said she did not want to be buried in the Native American burial ground, but that's exactly what the townsfolk did when she died. I don't know why she would be buried in a Native American burial ground unless she herself were Native American. Anyway, she wasn't happy with this because strange voices and loud rappings would wake up the residents. They also endured flying objects. Eventually, they ended up reinterring her in the town cemetery, and things eventually quieted down. So that's it for this episode. As always, you can find Lurk wherever you find your other favorite podcasts. You can also find episodes at lurkpodcast.com, where we have links to our social media accounts including Patreon, so remember to sign up for just $5. You're like, $5 foot long. Forget the sub. Go to Patreon. I am going to tell you, the next bonus Patreon episode is Missing 411. You're not going to hear it unless you go pay $5 to the Patreon account. Help Help a girl out. I will tell you, the bonus episode is going to deal with Uh, cases of children who have gone missing that involve them being protected by bears and bears is in air quotes so if you are interested in hearing that go fill out the patreon thing and you know pay five dollars five dollar foot long anyway we do have the festivals coming up june 24th in sykesville maryland august 26th in reynoldsville pennsylvania and September 30th in Whitehall, New York. Like I keep telling you, if you're in the area, stop by and say hello. Get a t-shirt. Maybe I'll give you a sticker. I don't know. But, until next time, keep lurking. Keep lurking.